Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M1M is the first and only global virtual incubator accelerator in the world with the mission of helping a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue, build a trillion dollars in global GDP and 10 million jobs. As you know, we've been doing this program for a little while now, and this is our 249th 1M1M roundtable. It's um, the series of free mentoring sessions that we do. And, um, you know, we're coming up to a major milestone next week, actually. Uh, so welcome, everybody. And uh, this is, you know, you know the housekeeping details, most of you who have been here before. And if you haven't been here, the event is being recorded. You will have a recording available on our blog as well as on the YouTube channel. Our Twitter handles are at 1M by 1M and at Romana. We push a lot of interesting content through Twitter. If you're live tweeting the show today, please use hashtag 1M1M. And our YouTube channel where you will find recordings of all prior sessions, and this one will be there as well, is 1M1M roundtables. Now, uh, these are the call-in instructions. We're not quite ready for you to call in right now, but we will be eventually, and I will put this slide up again so that you can call in. And today we are actually celebrating two books with a great guest who's one of my personal heroes. The Bootstrapping with a Paycheck in the Entrepreneur Journey series is our 11th volume. And then Billion Dollar Unicorns is the most recent 12th volume of the Entrepreneur Journey series. And our guest today, Girish Navani, CEO of eClinical e Works, is somebody I've known for many years now and have admired his work, his entrepreneurial journey from, for a very long time. And he is going to talk to you about both of these, you know, issues, both building a billion dollar unicorn company as well as uh, bootstrapping with a paycheck. Girish has bootstrapped eClinical Works without a penny of outside financing. And today the company is approaching a $300 million revenue level. The company is private, and Girish intends to keep the company private. We'll talk about all that in uh, due course. But if you look at a software-as-a-service company in healthcare IT, both of those are very hot fields today. And if you look at his revenue run rate, his growth rate and everything, and if you apply the valuation equation to it, this company is easily a $3, million plus, a $3 billion plus company in the public market or in any kind of exit valuation. So by all means, it's a unicorn, and um, it's a unique unicorn. It's a bootstrap private unicorn. So welcome, Girish. Your, your achievements are fantastic, and our audience is eager to hear from you. Well, thank you for having me on, and uh, I'm delighted to be a part of this conversation. This time I get to see you on the video channel, which is even better. <laughs> but not as good as the face, which is not as good as the face time that we had in California. But thank you for having me on. So Girish, let's um, let's start with perhaps your beginning, and uh, uh, because you managed to bootstrap this company with a paycheck, it gave you lots of flexibility. From what I remember of what you told me at the of the very beginning of your story, you kind of took your time to get the product right to talk to customers and, and, you know, get a sense of where you were going at your own pace. Talk to us a bit about that period of your journey. I think you're, you're very right in being very insightful in the biggest aspect of taking the time. I think it's too often where we try to rush to getting a product to market versus making sure you get to listen to more of that input and feedback and make it right before you actually get to market. And by funneling it through more conservative sources, as I call them, i.e. your own money, you don't have the outside pressure of suddenly becoming profitable and or trying to get your valuations to go up because of top line growth. It gives you what I call the depth of product which helps you, as we'll talk today, later on as you start scaling the company. Your mindset changes. And uh, if I 
may also point out, Girish, the time when you started this company, healthcare IT was not a hot field at all, right? It was a very beginning of adoption of information technology in the healthcare field. So the customer base, these doctor's offices that you were selling to, were not really the, you know, the places where you're, uh, you would get fast adoption. So you were going into a market that was not mature and not fast growth. So I, I imagine the choices you made of going at it slower were actually very beneficial choices to give the market some time to develop as well. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, I joke about it. Today, my kids think I'm doing something cool because there's a lot of buzz about it. You know, there's venture money flowing into it. It's being talked about no differently than social media. Right. But 1999 was not a period of time for wow. healthcare IT to be exciting. If anything, it was mundane. It was considered to be an industry that was never going to change. Uh, but those are ones that you actually need to focus on because those are where the biggest opportunities lie uh, and trying to make a difference. And I think to, to build something really controversial, Girish, uh, uh, if you want to say something to the people who are disturbing you behind your back, please feel free to do that. It's okay. I tell them, they're trying to help me with the speaker phone, and I want to tell them they don't need to worry anymore. Just hold on. I'm all set. It's working beautifully. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. They're trying to help me to see if this echo would go away. <laughs> well, so um, I, I think the, some of the biggest successes in business also come from contrarian bets. And you certainly made a contrarian bet at a time when this was not the hot market. And, and if you, that's also part of what I see in, in your story and in many of the other unicorn stories that we've done is that if you make a contrarian bet, then you're going to have to let the market kind of catch up with you because you're typically early. I, I think you're right. It, it's contrarian and it's hard. I think there are two aspects to this that make for what I call long-term sustainable businesses. The barrier to entry starts getting harder, if not higher, as the market matures. So not only do you get into a market where most people don't think you're going to be successful, and then as you start having success, and if the barriers to entry are higher because it is a deep market with a lot of domain knowledge, it needs a lot of depth in product R&D. And let's say it needs a pretty significant service component because this is not unlike a app that you download that you don't provide customer service for. It's a pretty intense service business. These help build a sustainable business which can outlast the ups and downs of any market economies or trends of, of market saturation and market consolidation. So yeah, I think betting early on is important, but so is, about, so is the whole idea of building a product, find out a company that is deeply rooted in what I call a vertically integrated ecosystem, which is not easy. I'd say you connect the consumer down to your supplier, whether it's a business model that Amazon's done with its whole supply chain on warehousing to e-commerce to Kindles, whether it's some fascinating other companies in supply chain that go from raw materials all the way to product to retail, you end up doing the same thing in healthcare where you try and tie a patient all the way down to a provider of service and you build the ecosystem along, built for a tremendously deep product line, which you can't speculate on early stages of that business model. You have to be in it for long term to understand its domain and its depth. So um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions which I have been asked a lot when I was um, doing interviews based on the bootstrapping using a paycheck book, and I just want to ask you these questions because I know these are on many minds, and then we're going to switch to a few other, you know, growth topics. So on the uh, bootstrapping using a paycheck book, at what point in your journey of that methodology did you quit and go full-time with the clinical works? At what time did you feel or feel convinced that it's going to work? Um, I took a two-step process. I actually went from the paycheck funding it 
to a leave of absence, which in a way still gave me some, you know, leeway and lever if it did not completely pan out, which was a six month period with a consultative role to with my employer to an all time or a full time swivel. It wasn't we had 10 people at the workplace. So it wasn't when I was the first person, I was the 10th actually person joining it. We had built a product that we knew our customers were finding very acceptable to a point where we thought they were loving the system compared to what they had been used to in the past or had expected. I would also built some confidence in the pipeline of leads that we were generating mm -hmm. that told me that if, if at this stage I actually jumped into this, I could accelerate that curve. I think it, the analogy is don't burn your wood when winter's just starting. You will actually need it when the winter gets a lot harsher. And businesses usually find that to be the curve not on the first day of innovation. That's the f most funnest day of your life. It gets harder in the first six months, 12 months, 18 months. And having no pressure of cash flow, then, you know, allows you to still stay consistent with your vision. So I left when we were into, I, I think in the second, late second year of the business, when I felt comfortable enough to say, we don't need to worry about this. Let's just jump into it all out because we won't have to worry and strap ourselves with cash flow problems. And your employer knew that you were doing e-clinical works on the side? Yes, yes. I had, uh, it was an open disclosure. Uh, once I had gotten serious about wanting to be a part of this, yes. All right, so um, let's talk about the evolution of the healthcare IT industry and how you have kind of accelerated your story, your journey, as well as broadened your product, uh, the product roadmap. I remember you started with uh, uh, an office physician, office management system, practice management system, and then now you have a very full-blown portfolio of products, so let's talk about your product strategy. Well, I think it, it fits this one premise. I'm looking for a business that lasts 50, 60, 80 years. I mean, that, you might laugh about it. Most people in technology don't think that far. You go, well, that's not a business. Typically, you know, five years, seven years, 10 years, you might be done with technology because the trends might surpass you. I'm fascinated with the idea of e-clinical work and its technology and the company outlasting its, its initial set of founders and going on to the next generation. With that in mind, you ask many different questions. How deep do you need to make your product where you'd always be in a paying choice for your customers? You ask the question, how do you develop the service strategy of your business where your customer base will refer you to others? And that will become an ongoing cycle, which then feeds into feedback loops from a diversity of clients, which will result into a deeper product line. So I think it, it in a way, is a pretty simple equation, if you ask me, how we went from having a, a module to having an integrated product that now ties the consumer, which is the patient, down to the provider, which is the doctor, and the entire ecosystem of labs, pharmacies, insurances, employers, e-commerce platforms, wearables. It's just been working with customers, listening to them, asking the question, what's the next wave that I need to bring into this product portfolio so that we don't become obsolete? More importantly, how do we still stay relevant conversation with our customers where they will still refer us to others because that's our predominant vehicle for sales and marketing. And you end up building a very deep product. And I'll tell you, before I finish this conversation, I'll tell you something very exciting, what we did last week, which has never happened in our company. But we're going to be venturing into something pretty big outside of our core starting this week. I'm actually in India, and there's something exciting I can talk about. So I think it's developed over time. It's developed with customer feedback. It's developed by understanding where the market's going. It's also been in ways that say, what's adjacent to our core? I'll also give you one other caution though. There have been many areas that we've said no to, and that's equally important. It's not just important to say, yes, let me add that capability, let me add that product, let me build a sales and marketing team around that particular service offering. 
it's equally important to ask the question, is this something that fits the long-term vision 10 years out? Is this something you'll be as passionate as you are about today, supporting that clientele? Because you don't want transactions, you want core business. And I think that makes for a pretty deep product line as you continue to chisel down that particular way of doing business. So folks, um, just to give you some more context about eClinical Works, this is probably one of the most important companies developing in healthcare IT. It's already a sizable company, but it's, it has the product portfolio and the market traction and momentum to go much further. Uh, if you look at probably a 2018 to 2020 horizon, this is going to be not just a billion dollar valuation company, it's going to be a billion dollar revenue company. And um, to achieve that kind of, um, you know, that kind of coverage, that kind of market coverage, that kind of market positioning, that product strategy is incredibly important. And, and here, as Girish explains, he started with something very simple, which was a physician practice management system, and then, then has gone to a much, much more full-blown product suite that is today giving him the opportunity to do $10 million a year kind of deals. And I remember because last time we, he came to California to, and, and we got together, he was actually coming off closing a $10 million deal. So I'm not talking about something that I haven't heard from Girish. So um, the, the core of all this, I, you know, if you want to extrapolate it out um, from Girish's journey and from what we see in other unicorn entrepreneurs' journeys, is that you are – solving a very, very complicated process. Healthcare in America is a very complicated process. It's cumbersome, it's, it's really awful actually. So when there is that kind of complexity and if you start using technology, leveraging technology to simplify that process and, and giving ammunition to the stakeholders to simplify that process, that actually creates the conditions for building very high exit barrier products and very large-scale companies. So that's one of the insights that uh, I have picked up and, and you know, learned from Girish's journey. So switching topics a little bit, Girish, you have categorically for years said that you have no interest in financing, you have no interest in exit. So talk to us a bit about why such an aversion <laughs> to financing, why do you dislike the public market so much, why don't you want exits? Talk about that philosophy. Well, the first one now, which is a lot easier today, is we don't need the capital because we're generating our own capital. We are a pretty profitable business that is generating tens of millions in cash flow. So we don't need the capital, so it's a lot easier today. But the aversion, the word you use, which is rightfully apply, applicant to, to the way I think, I look at it like a camel entering the tent. If he or she puts the nose in, they're going to blow up the tent. If you borrow even $100,000 when your valuation is a million, that might net them 10%. And 10% of today's company would, can only be returned by either selling the business or by going public. Either of those two, I see the exit of an entrepreneur's dream. It's not something that's pretty common today. I mean, we actually think it's the start or the milestone of success. I see this as a milestone of failure, that I couldn't continue down the vision of having built a company that could grow organically, end up acquiring more customers, diversifying the vision broadly enough and impacting the industry. So the aversion comes because I think we get impatient with borrowing capital. That's the first one. Second, you lose control. Often capital comes from sources whose principle is built around ROI, return on investment, return on capital. It's not built around return of vision, return of impact to industry. And those sometimes can become contradictory. And that aversion comes from me being comfortable with the freedom I enjoy. Um, 
You know, it doesn't always pay out, but in, in this case it did. I think if I look back at it from even a financial standpoint, it would be a pretty wise move um, long term, having kept the company private, independent, generating cash flow. 15 years from now, I think it'll probably generate more than a billion in cash flow. Yeah, well, and I think uh, all of those points are, you know, somewhat true, not do you always lose control of your vision? The story of Mark Zuckerberg shows that you don't always lose control of your vision. The guy turned down a billion dollar acquisition offer from Yahoo. He basically told his investors that, no, I'm not gonna do this deal. The investors jaw dropped and they're like, what are you talking about? You're 22 years old and you're not gonna do this deal? It's a billion dollar offer from Yahoo. And, and he said, no, because what am I gonna do with the money? And the guy said, you can start another social networking company. And then he said, no, but I like the one that I'm running. <laughs> That's right, Ma. I think the whole idea of I like what I'm doing. And, you know, it, it's, there's something to be said about your first love and your first success. That it was not my quote unquote first venture. I mean, I, I used to write Moonlight software before and had some successes with those technologies as well, but not to the extent of the clinical work. I think there's something to be said about persevering and continuously trying to succeed at your core belief that technology can improve healthcare. I have found my calling. So there are many things that apply here. I believe in this industry. I think it's an industry that desperately needs people to focus on it long term. Healthcare is fun now, but healthcare is also serious. Health can have a positive impact on human life. I just think it, it, it can almost build a successful social conscious company that has a high moral compass. You can't trade that. I'm not saying it applies to every other vertical, but it applies to me and it applies to our company. I think it's the best way to do it. Yeah. Public would make me distracted. I don't have to worry about quarterly earnings, and I hate them. I, I don't want to tell people what I'm investing money in. I'd rather just spend it when I feel like it's the right thing to do. Yeah. That's important point is if you go public, then you have to kind of work within the framework of the public markets, quarterly earnings and reports and, and so forth. And, and although um, there are, well, Amazon, I think, has set a precedent in the public market of make, taking a very long-term view of how they deal with profits and growth and investments into new technologies and new areas and so forth. And the market has has not penalized them for producing very little profit, basically. Amazon doesn't produce much profit, and they have convinced their investors that they're investing in the long term and investing in growth, and, and the market lets them do that. But very few companies in history has been able to do that, and, and most of them kind of are subject at the mercy, basically, of the vagaries of the market. So if you miss a quarter, then you get penalized, and if you, you know, Blah, blah, blah. It's a very stressful, very kind of unappetizing way of life. So uh, I guess what you're saying is you don't want to run a public company, and that's perfectly understandable. Okay, so um, let me actually see yeah, if... Yeah, um, I'm having fun. You're having fun, yeah. That's, a, that's the most important thing. And, and you're still quite young, so there's a... If you sold your company today and... and were showered with billions of dollars, then what? What are you gonna do with that money? This is a question that very few people ask themselves. And you know, you can't play that much golf. You cannot do that much sailing. You cannot do anything that is gonna give you the kind of stimulation that actually doing interesting, meaningful work is gonna give you. I mean, I, I just don't think retirement is that exciting. I mean, if anybody thinks retirement is exciting, in your prime of your professional career. Okay. I think retirement is very boring. I have no interest in retiring ever. So, it's like he, us, I mean, take good measure, real kind of satisfaction, fulfillment out of their work. I don't think retirement is a good thing to look forward to. But then other people think that, okay, I will sell this one and, and start another company. Um, that's another thing that I've seen and some people do, you know, over and over again, um, start new companies, build new companies. We are seeing Elon Musk do it over and over again. 
um, and several other people have done it over and over again. That's a, that's a more reasonable path forward. If you do sell, then that's a more reasonable path forward. But again, if you're, if you're working on something like Girish's and you've got a certain amount of scale and, and you really like what you do, you believe in what you do, I think it's actually great to be able to, con to build and continue to grow on the same vision using that platform because as you gain market power, there's a lot of, a uh, lot more leverage that you get than starting something from absolute scratch. I'll add one thing to this. Yeah. It does take guts to do what we do. It's a lot easier to say, let's bank the success, right? You either go public, you get an asset, you get some investors. I call it banking your asset. It's called risk mitigation. It's called securing your financials, whatever it might be. And, you know, there were a lot of people in 2004, 2005, when we were an $18 million company, then moving to $50 million, $60 million, where it wasn't unreasonable to ask, were we taking too big a risk? Were we going to never reach the successes of both our revenues and our cash flows versus somebody wanting to put $20 million in the business? I, I think it takes a lot of guts. And I also think it takes a mindset that you said you don't love money as much as you love success. And if that equation can be done, then you won't worry about the cash. You say, you know what? If it doesn't grow that big, who cares? It's still being successful. And you make that trade off. I mean, that's what people say, right? That the ones that take the risk are the ones that make the biggest successes, the ones that make the biggest impact. I think trying to stay the course is not easy. Getting out of that particular business at an early stage of banking your success is easier. Well, I think there's a threshold of money that, you know, you kind of need to feel secure. And once that is, once you've achieved that, then you can actually make these higher order decisions which are going to be determining how much impact you're going to have on the world, how much enjoyment you're going to get out of your life actually that includes an interesting, fulfilling professional path. And, and we have, by the way, folks, in, the, uh, in this book, we have two other entrepreneurs who are following a similar track as Girish. One is Sridhar Vembu of Zoho, and the other is Ratmi Tamishev of um, Veeam, uh, Ratni will be in the, um, uh, in the series later on in the program. I've seen him um, on the schedule. Girish, you were about to add something? No, I, I was going to agree with what you, what you were about to say. And I think you were, you were hitting upon something that was rightful too, which is definitions of success in the life of an entrepreneur change. So in the first, you know, if you want to break it down into quadrants, in the first quadrant, you just want people to buy or use what you're developing. Yeah. In the second quadrant, you're more into, can I be profitable? Can I be broadly successful? Third quadrant, can you focus on longevity and build a business that's going to have deeper roots and deeper vision? And then you get to this last one, which is pretty intriguing. I don't think I've gotten there yet, but I've started thinking about it. When you start measuring success, in the success of others around you. And you start asking the question that is much broader. Let's say, how are you going to define that your business and you as an entrepreneur have done what you wanted to do? And the success then is not the first three. It's more about the impact it had, sometimes social, sometimes on people that work at the workplace, sometimes your customers, and sometimes just your, your end users, your patients whose lives might be healthier, your providers who end up delivering better care. And I think when that equation fits in, it becomes a mesmerizing way to build a business because then you're really carefree and you focus on saying, well, this is amazing. Why stop now? Very interesting. You know, Girish, we have taken on something where our, the whole mission of the program is, is kind of built into making other people successful. One million by one million is to help a million entrepreneurs get to a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. So our you know, entire existence is predicated upon the success of others. We have no business being anywhere if they are not successful and they're not finding it useful to use what we are putting together here. That's exciting. <laughs>
All right. Well, uh, thank you for being here. I know you're, it's kind of late uh, in India right now, but, uh, but you, we, ha we see a lot of Indian entrepreneurs attend these sessions, so I'm sure they're all enjoying listening to you, and more will through the recordings. We will keep in touch. I would love to keep talking to you, and, uh, and uh, thank you for coming. Great. Thank you. And I told you I was going to tell you something exciting before I left. <laughs> we've, we've closed a pretty large international deal. It, 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 it valued at its, its, its true core, it could be excess of 50 million. And it's going to impact Europe and, far, and, and Australia and New Zealand. And we're very excited about it. It is something that is. Tell us more, different. or is <laughs> Well, it's a customer with 2,000 locations in the world, all outside the United States. That's what okay. I can tell you. And, and we are, we are, we are, we're having fun doing that project. And it's going to be an exciting one. And um, in another few months, I'll probably tell you a lot more about it. But okay. we're going to be opening up a UK. We're going to be opening up a UK office in the end of this quarter. Super! Congratulations and good luck with developing that area. Great. Okay, folks. Well, thank you. We're going to move to the mentoring part of the uh, program, and um, I am not sure if. Um, did you want to stay for the mentoring part? I know you had some technical issues. We we weren't yeah, sure. I might have to leave now. I will. I'll probably sign off unless you want me to stay on it. No, it's up to you, really. Um, if you want to stay, you're welcome to stay. If if you have to go, that's fine too. I understand it's late back there. Great. Well, thank you for having me again. Um, look forward to speaking to you again in the future. Likewise. Parfait, you are up as our first pitch, so uh, please unmute your line and tell us what Hey Biz is. Uh, hi, this is Bhatesh. Good morning to uh, you, and I don't know from other, what part of the people of, are here, but uh, I want to say hi to them. Uh, I'm from India, uh, New Delhi area. A uh, little bit about myself, I'm, uh, I'm a technology guy and I've been to internship for the last couple of years, uh, was in Cisco in San Silicon Valley, came back to India and started one company, raised uh, around uh, uh, from zero to 20 million users base, and down now I've jumped to Habeas. Uh, the idea became uh, coming to, uh, for the Habeas is that uh, I'm a messaging guy, and since WhatsApp has changed the scenario over here uh, in, in the world that uh, a lot of people are now doing a lot of stuff on the messaging, uh, and then I thought that why not I do something for for uh, SMBs, small and medium businesses. Uh, just can you go to the next slide so that I can tell you the numbers why the idea came in. Uh, in India specifically, uh, there are around uh, 50 million register users and uh, on, on the on the record, and there are around the 32, 35 million unregistered small and medium businesses. Uh, but only the fact is there are just 5% on the internet. Uh, the reason being they don't know about uh, what is the internet or they don't know uh, how to deal with the uh, with the internet, like what they do with the internet. Uh, even though they have website, but they don't know how to promote their business on, on the internet. So I did a survey and then figured out that, okay, they are losing business also because they are not internet, they are losing business on the online portals. and. And the big giants are forcing them to adhere to their conditions to sell the product. So they have whatever the investment are there on the retail side, it's it's going waste right now. So so that's why a a Habis, uh, came in where uh, we 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 are building a platform as a messaging as well as engagement platform for the small and medium businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit about it that a it's just like a WhatsApp for the businesses. A business guy comes, download the application, up, upload their business profile, a very simple steps, and he's ready to talk to the people. Uh, and, and on the other side, the consumer comes, uh, he finds out what other business he's looking for locally, nationally, or internationally. They start chatting with them and talk about their product, talk about the services, if they like it, they either, either can ask them to do an order, or they go to their shop and then just buy it. Rather than uh, researching a lot on the internet, because the people are having a mobile now, and on the mobile, searching, looking at 10 other different web uh, sites, and find out which is best, it's better that they go and talk to them easily, 
while sitting at their home. So an example is that I have to buy a a appointment for the saloon. So I just look around who all the saloons are available, ask them then if they are available, the timings are available. They say yes, and then say, okay, please book my appointment. In simple three or four text messages, the deal is done. Uh, the second slide that is just replicating the next slide is just replicating the the statistics what we have in India. Uh, would you like to go to uh, next slide? Uh, yeah, so this is uh, the survey uh, done in 2013, uh, which talks about that how how back we are. The SMA is market still back on the internet. Uh, the the next slide, please. Uh, so I think this this pattern is based on your uh, recommendation. So the, how we are uh, trying to do uh, acquire the customers. Uh, we launched it a month back. Our alpha version is out on the app stores. Uh, we have started with my local area uh, within like 10 kilometers where I live uh, in Delhi. And, and there are around uh, uh, 5,000 uh, small and medium businesses are there. And we're trying to talk to them. We're trying to give them this, uh, this uh, uh, our solution is free of cost for the now and asking them to use it as much as they want, they can use it. So we are going to shop to shop and doing campaign about it. And, and we are getting a good response. Like uh, uh, we go to 100 shops in a day and then we get back the 80 people who, who are ready to sign up uh, with our system. Uh, and we are doing some promotions for them on the social network because we have a, uh, I have a small team uh, who does the promotion for them on the, on the social network. So that's why business are getting attracted. Mm -hmm. uh, on the consumer okay. side, so yeah. you're saying that these people are going to be using the product for free and, and you are getting response from 80 out of 100 uh, touch points a day. Right. Do you have a sense of what would be the conversion rates if there was a business model? I mean, you, at the end of the day, you're going to need a business model to build a business, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. So uh, uh, that's uh, a little bit, I would say, pre-alpha I did exercise with the uh, with a little bit premium businesses also. We have got uh, around 12 premium businesses uh, who have uh, uh, around 225 uh, franchises uh, in the market. For example, uh, one uh, Snap Fitness is there. I, I, I'm sure you must be knowing that it's a US uh, uh, company he has launched in India also and they have around 50 branches. So I have a tie with them and, and say, These, those are the, going to be my paid customers. So they, they said, okay, I would like to have about, these. Tell me a more, bit more about that customer, this, the one with the 50. Um, so, uh, Snap Fitness. This? The Snap. Okay, Snap Fitness is a, is a, is a gym and spa. Uh, they, have a, uh, they have a 50 branches in India, Pan India. And uh, they are looking for expansion. They are looking for investors for the, for the franchises, and they are looking for a customers also. For, uh, uh, for for their uh, gyms to promote the gyms, right? So we are working with them, uh, and uh, uh, through this platform, they they want to interact uh, with with the customers as a minister directly. So I have configured uh, our platform has a capability that one one master franchisee can have multiple franchises, and then they can track each and every franchisee how they are doing, how they. And we on other our side, we are doing promotion for them. We are educating our users, like what are the benefits they can get it uh, if they come to this uh, staff fitness. Similarly with staff fitness, we have got 12 brands uh, who, who have a lot of branches and they, they are our potential uh, uh, paid customers in, in the beginning. Uh, for, but but the, our main core is to the, to the normal local business uh, who are there and they say that yes, if they get traffic, they definitely uh, pay us. They already paying to just dial kind of company, like some money they are putting to them. But most of them, they are not very happy because uh, just dial is so big, it can't cater uh, uh, each and every uh, small and medium business. So, so they are looking for a second channel where they can start getting some leads. So they say, yes, if, we, if our platform can generate a lead for them, they are ready to pay for it. Okay. So, and, so, uh, so yeah. What is the yeah, business please. model? How are you going to how are you going to charge them when you get to the paid product? What is the business model against which you're charging? 
the business model is very simple. I have kept it. Uh, just like people pay for SMS, uh, we I ask them to pay for messages. Like as soon as the customer talks to them on this thing, then then the billing starts, and it's very minimum. Like uh, I know, I'm sure you uh, understand our uh, units. It's five pesa, five pesa per SMS per message which comes to him. And that they have to be. If the customer sends to the business or business sends to the customer, so that's it. So that they are happy with that because unless I generate traffic for them, they don't have to pay. There is no listing fee. There is no uh, kind of a featured of a listing or there's no some uh, the 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 unnatural thing is there because and they can secure also because they say okay yeah if the customer comes to me just like a just like a uh, mm, on their shop, some customer has come and he asked the query and then goes away. So for that, if they have to pay five pesos as well. So then um, these premium businesses that you are, you know, planning to sell to, selling paid products to, what, mm -hmm. are, what is your anticipation of the volume of messages and how much money are you going to make from a customer of the size that you were talking about? See, the premium businesses, the model is different because we are handling uh, the customer uh, uh, queries and replies, and once they get once they get satisfied, then we convert them. So that is it on the percentage basis. So one lead, whatever the transaction they have, it is a percentage-based model. I have kept it for them. Uh, for local businesses who who want to who want to entertain the customer by themselves, for them is the messaging. Uh, I am not. I have not gone to that deeper as of now because uh, uh, I myself don't know actually as of now to tell you frankly. But I'm expecting like within like six months uh, I would be generating uh, around one million messages uh, per month. Uh, uh, the way the way we are going as of now. So so that's the target. So so one million into five pesa. It's, it's, that would be the initial cost to start coming up. So are you? Uh, uh, Right now, based on where you are, do you think that's a reasonable projection? Uh, that, that's a tough, uh, 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 that's a tough target. That's uh, definitely a tough target. Uh, but but that's the target we have set for ourselves that we have to reach there. Otherwise, uh, we we will not able to sustain the business. Otherwise, I have to go out and raise the funds or. Um, uh, initially, when I started, it, my idea was just like Mr. Garish, who just spoke uh, that they want to sell the same so that they can re. That was my thing. I came in. Uh, uh, so, so for six months, we have a capital, so we want to reach that target so that we can start showing a good results. Uh, because after that, it will be exponential. That we know. So, first six so right months are for us. If you look at your current uh, cash situation, etc., when do you? When can you show proof of concept, including this, the financial equation that you're talking about that's being validated? See, the, uh, we are already in the proof of concept stage, and, and, and we are validating our idea. So the, by March end, we uh, will we'll, uh, mature ourselves enough that now we have to scale, scale in terms of getting more and more businesses. When does the financial model get validated? Uh, the financial, see, as of now, the, uh, the the premium businesses they are ready to pay for the lead. They say, okay, get that. So, so so when we start, paying premium we are not paying a percentage. I I'm not convinced about that. Uh, so you need to. If that's the that's the proposition that you're going to want to you know present to investors. You're going to need to get validation on that. Okay. You may be right. I may, I, you know, I'm, I just don't. Just instinctively, it sounds like a, a business model that may not work. Or, but if it works, great. So you're going to have to prove that it works. Uh, see, the premium, for the premium businesses, yes, you are right. Uh, there is one challenge I'm facing uh, right now is that uh, the focus, right? Uh, because for premium businesses, I need a dedicated team who understand their their business very well so that we can talk on behalf of them and, and we should have much more capability to convince the customer also that okay this business is the right business for you. These are two so, different so, 
trying to do is two different businesses. It's very hard to do as a small company two different businesses. Okay. So what do you suggest? Right. Uh, no, I understand. But what I'm saying, what do you suggest? That's why I've been here to hear uh, the, the the right guidance. I I would pick one or the other, and, and depending on which one has more, you know, which one validates better. Right now, you can try to do this at the validation stage. You can try to validate both and and get a sense of which one is validating, and then. You have to figure out how do you scale each of these businesses and, and what are the numbers, what are the, you know, how much money are you making and, and what would it take to get to a million dollar, five million dollar, twenty million dollar, hundred million dollar business and which business of the two is going to get you there faster and, and it will depend and, and if you're looking to do this as a fundable business, as an investor funded business, it's very important that you, you're able to figure out which of these is going to actually scale. Because you're, See, you mean, scale is, you're saying this is going to be exponential, but if it's exponential in a 30-year time frame, that's not a venture-fundable timeline. <laughs> I know, I, I still know for the past one and a half months, we're all trying, we found that the local business is the market, is the uh, a mass market, is the needed market, is uh, uh, can help us to scale very quickly. Uh, so, 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 but again, I have to validate. You have no validation for that. You're, you've got this, you know, right now you you don't know whether the local business is actually going to generate a lot of money or not. Uh, yes. Yeah. See, the, the, yeah, that we have to validate it, definitely. Uh, but the response which we are getting it, uh, it is, is good. Uh, every day we are uh, adding like around now today as of today we are adding like 50 businesses because of the limited uh, people we have it. Uh, but the thing is that they, they feel happy that Arthesh, your business yeah. model is predicated not just upon signing these local businesses. It is actually connecting consumers to these local businesses. That's a whole order, whole other level and order of complexity that you haven't yet figured out. Uh, on the user side, uh, we we did a, a small uh, uh, campaign recently that okay, uh, chat koro cash koro. Uh, there we saw a a, a a response. I won't say very good response because we didn't do the mass marketing on that one. But the with the local area, which we say that people got interested. Okay, okay, they come here, they talk to the people, and and, and they get some incentivized also. So that way, I we trying to attract the users. To, to come and end then, and then showing them the capability of the system, where they are feel comfortable, where they uh, they can go to the depth of the system. So yeah, that validation is going on, and and I think uh, I will have a clear picture by by March end uh, for for the both sides. Well, the business, business I, my comment on your funding is that it will be hard to convince investors until you can put some metrics on the table. What are the unit econ economics of your business and how do you scale this business? Is this going to be scaling fast enough? That's the key question that investors are going to want, to, uh, want answers to. If you cannot answer that question, you cannot get this business funded. Okay. Okay? Yeah. So, in how you're managing the business, how you're operating the business, I would say two things. One is you cannot do these two businesses in parallel. I think they're two different businesses. And secondly, whichever one you choose to do, you need to understand the unit economics and be able to convince investors that this is going to scale fast and, and this is why it's going to scale fast. And I just don't see that in your presentation right now. Okay. So I'll work on it and come back. All right. Great. So approach okay. investors after you've got a handle of that piece of the story. We absolutely work. India is our, one of our largest geographies. We work with Indian companies constantly. So you, to answer your question about how do we help Indians, if you just hang on, I will spend some time at the end of the session explaining how to work with 1M1M. So just hold your question. Okay. After I've gone through that, you can ask more questions if you have that, the other questions. Okay, sure. Okay, um, thank you, Bharatesh. Shubra, you're up next. Hi, uh, Shamuna, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, uh, uh, this is about a, uh, 
about a healthcare uh, in, in the healthcare segment once again. And uh, here uh, we are trying to connect doctors to the patients. And at the same time, uh, there will be certain uh, uh, benefits for the users who I will be referring as patients for now uh, will have. Now, this is not only a platform where the doctors will be connecting uh, to the patient or a patient will be finding a doctor. Mm -hmm. Doctor has their uh, backend, like their software, I mean, their practice management software. Uh, completely including their billing and uh, you know uh, other other whatever their requirements are uh, we we have uh, for patients also there are uh, features which are available uh, which you know in, in, in different slides I have now uh, the idea is to uh, minimize the time for finding a doctor book an appointment uh, for the doctor, uh, it will be having everything under uh, one platform, starting from patient's records to the uh, keeping their previous records to previous prescriptions to their any billing is pending or whatsoever for a regular patient. The patient will be in a position to not only mention the record, but they will also be able to share the record with any other doctor with at any, any uh, place. Uh, number three is we have we are trying to I mean the the uh, the site is in place the software is working functional and uh, we have about we started I'm from New Delhi area and uh, we in Delhi MCR area we have registered about six and a half thousand doctors uh, uh, we have got about thirty or uh, thirty thirty five uh, uh, backlash added to that. Now, uh, this will uh, help one manage and maintain their health and health record related facility uh, under one roof. That is the idea. Uh, there are other, other uh, add-ons also are there which uh, right now we have uh, not added uh, as of now. But this is the total area uh, and how we uh, look at the business. So, um, Shubro, question there. Um, first and foremost, there are a number of health portal connecting doctors to patients kinds of uh, ventures that we have seen come through here from India. What is your analysis of the competitive landscape? Uh, very good question, uh, Sermana. It's like this. Uh, all of them have got uh, doctor-patient connectivity, but mm -hmm. not all of them are providing uh, one platform under which a patient gets uh, even, uh, you know, kind of uh, keeping their records to having some benefits so far as their health uh, uh, records are concerned. They can keep, keep it. We have a... a, a we have a we have a uh, in, the, in the product there's a thing called health card. This health card uh, there are four types of health card we have right now. Uh, we are yet to launch though, but all these health cards will enable one to get different kind of discounts and facilities depending on which criteria they fall under. And uh, this health card at one point in time will also be will will be connecting insurance to it. So that, uh, I mean, a, a big amount of problem, what on a practical level I have also uh, seen, if uh, you, we go to the, if we, even all the, all the insurances say that we are cashless, but when you go there, there is a lot of paperwork involvement and a lot of uh, hassles are there. So the idea will be to overcome them and make healthcare in a, in a better way. What are you saying? Are you saying that you're going to handle all the insurance complexities for doctors and for patients? Is that something? Is that part of your value proposition? Yes, we'll be adding insurance too. We have insurance. We have uh, already no, no, no. added insurance. Bro, just yes. a second. You need to get to the core of the value proposition. 
if you look at a company called Athena Health, that is a public company in the U.S. healthcare market, has done very, very well. They focus on one core issue, and now they do a lot more, a lot of other things. But the 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 problem, the pain point that they solved very well for doctors' offices is to do collections from insurance companies, and it's a very cumbersome process. There's a lot of paperwork, a lot of codes, a lot of you know, crap involved, and, and they basically took all that as a almost like a business process outsourcing thing. They had technology and they had agents who were basically handling the collections for all the doctor's offices, and they would take a percentage of those collections as their fee. This is a very, very core and very well uh, articulated positioning. It's one core pain point that they're solving. Whereas in your case, you have a whole Chinese menu of problems that you're solving, but I would like you to get to one core pain point for which you are the preferred solution versus everybody else in the market. Okay. Um, right now, the solutions what are offered in the market is you can, you can book a doctor, uh, but many times the SMS calls that elsewhere as well. You can book doctors' appointments elsewhere as well. You can select doctors elsewhere as well. There are lots of comp there's lots of competition in that space. Yes, you do. But at the same time, if uh, we are in a position to provide the doctor's management software to to the doctor, mm -hmm. then the patient. I mean, this uh, solution, to the best of my knowledge, is not available where a patient is in a position to share his or her data prior to meeting the doctor. At the same time, uh, the reason this, uh, uh, what, what we have is a person, I mean, where in India, you know, it's, it's a little uh, different, I'm sure you are, you are much aware of, uh, than me, but this, all the products, whatever uh, is, is uh, payable, a person is in a position to pay by his debit card, credit card, or you know, net banking. So, <coughs> under one roof, if there is a uh, medical emergency happens, uh, it is not only doctors, you don't need to go to four different sites, you are under one site, we are in a position to get the benefit and the advantage of uh, taking all the facilities under one uh, website. I think what you're so trying to is that you want to host the medical records and make them shareable with multiple different doctors and, and labs and, and so forth as your primary value proposition, if that's if I'm hearing you right. Yes. Because the because finding doctors and all that is commodity. I think what the, the, the positioning that you're trying to go for is being able to consolidate the medical records and make them shareable across doctors. That's what you're saying. Absolutely. And at the same time, if a second opinion is required from, I know, I mean, our uh, idea is to, you know, uh, bring the, the uh, enter, uh, uh, I mean, basically to, to make the chain longer so that a person sitting in, anywhere is in a position to uh, share his or her data with another part of the doctor, or doctor will also be in a position to take another, you know, in, in case of coming, you know, kind of uh, discussion. Uh, on a patient, on a particular uh, problem. So it will be, you know, at the time of a problem, it is not that, you know, uh, you need to go to four different sites, four different places to find one solution. The idea is to come to one place and you are in a position in sharing, uh, discussing, and uh, kind of uh, talking to each other and access the record at the time of any eventuality. Okay, so what is your question? Uh, firstly, I would like to know from you how, how do you find it. As of now, this is how it stands. Now, uh, in future, we have, we have the plan to add some more. Like, as I said, the insurance will be a part of it. So do you have customers? Is this product selling right now? Uh, Ramana, just now we have, as I said, that in, in well, the doctors who we have on our list, they are verified doctors. Point one. Point number two, uh, whosoever doctor, I mean, whatever we are saying that we do, we do that. Like, 
I mean, uh, I have seen certain, I will not name or I am nobody to criticize anyone, but I have seen that, you know, I mean, there are people who just uh, have shown that, say you are looking for a doctor or a particular service, you say that it, um, up to certain point it works and after it doesn't. Sibra, that's not my question. I have to move on to the next presenter, but here, my, the question I'm asking you is, what, is this product now being used? Is it being sold? At what price? Who's paying? How do you make money out of this business? These are the key questions that you need to ask and answer. Okay. The doctors are paying for doctor uh, practice management software. They are happy with the product. They have asked for certain changes. We are working on that. That is you are in the management business as well. You're, you're actually providing practice management software as well. Yes. That is your core money-making business. Uh, no. If you ask me, there are three places from where we, we uh, will earn our revenue. One is practice management software. Number two is the selling the card to uh, customers. Because they will be getting certain benefits and advantage from if they are customer, which includes corporate, and where corporate health checkup is a good amount of money. Now we have tied up uh, uh, tie ups with with certain uh, uh, you know clinics and agencies who give a discounted rate, so company earns from there. But they uh, they give this card to the family, to the uh, uh, kind of employee which which is meant for the family. And the entire family gets the benefit of certain discounts. That is our second revenue. And there is a third revenue as of now is from the uh, uh, from this uh, lab who allows certain discounts uh, to the cardholders. So we pass on a part of that to the customer and we keep written one. So in all three places, this is our three uh, part of revenue as of now. Is any of this validated? Is anybody, are you making money of the business right now? We have just launched it about three months back. Uh, so we, uh, the acceptance from the doctors and senior doctors are there. And now there are people from, uh, who are not, we have never met, but they are coming to the site and they are becoming members because they also can become members online by making the payment and certain features which are not uh, allowed for free member, for a free member, becomes uh, allowed immediately. <coughs> so that kind of online things are happening, although it is not a very big number what I can uh, you know, tell you right now. People, yes, they are coming to the site, but right now this card feature is perhaps you are the first person outside my team who I am sharing this information to. So, uh, we are in the process of going out in the market and we are building up, we were building up, we are very serious about making the software because that is what people will be using. So that must be error free and give correct information. That's what we worked upon. And we have definitely given uh, importance uh, uh, for, for people to have their feedback so that we can in a position to, we are in a position to, you know, kind of go out to people, reach out to people. You need to, you, right now it seems like none of this is validated. All your assumptions are you built a bunch of software, but not much of it is validated. You need to, as soon as possible, get paying customers so that you can, you know, get, get this stuff validated. Absolutely. We are working on that. And uh, the, the uh, I mean, so today we have about uh, 20 to 25 customers every day who are booking through our site and who the doctors who are there going, they are also happy with it. And there are doctors we are, we have, as I told you, that we have paid customers, I mean, at least uh, 15 to 20 paid some customers, so far as the doctors are concerned, are coming to our, uh, our, our network. That is, that is the thing. Now, we need to grow, we need to uh, reach out to people, we need to go out to more doctors and people so that you know, this, this entire model becomes more successful because it's completely people-based and uh, networking-based. All right. Well, I guess you need to, uh, you know what you need to do. You need to go sell more than anything else. Absolutely.
All right. Anything else you can suggest? No, I can't suggest anything. If there's no validation in the company, you need to go validate. It's as simple as that. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Pranaya Rajwadi, you are up next. Pranay on the call? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Pranay. Hi, Pranay. Hi. Oh, so, you need uh, to talk. Can you? To talk. Yeah, go ahead. But the um, echo from the computer. Uh, have both the computer and your phone on right now. Yeah. Is it better now? I think so. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, thank you for giving time, Shamana. Uh, uh, so we are Plan versus Actual dot com, and we are a company who uh, is a you know uh, help the customers, uh, you know, compare their plan with actual, right? So like uh, any enterprise organization, right? Especially, it is a B2B SaaS based uh, startup, right? So it's a based on cloud, and uh, it will help customer uh, compare their plan with actual and tell them that how they adhere to the plan, and what are the reasons they could not adhere to the plan, and uh, you know which are the top three reasons they should be focusing on. And uh, we are we are trying to give the customers, uh, you know, the whole enterprise business view in a nutshell. We are starting with the manufacturing department by comparing the production plan with actual production and, you know, taking it from there. And right now we don't have customers. We have started to approach customers. And, uh, you know, the kind of uh, response we get from customers, uh, our product is we have just a demo version ready. We don't have the entire thing ready. Uh, because we need data, and uh, the kind of response we get from the customer is it will be very useful. But so far, uh, we haven't got any customer who has uh, you know said that we are uh, ready to buy it. So that's uh, so, um, you know. It's the, the next question uh, for you: Before you build this product, did you do any validation on the concept, or did you just go ahead and build the product and then started going to meet customers? So, uh, you know, I was working in a company and, you know, there I implemented a part of it, which is just the planning and the actual comparison and that again. And, uh, and they're still using it, right? And uh, so because we automated it, right, on a on week after week, they can, you know, compare the plan and actual automatically and they will automatically get the report, you know, every Monday morning kind of. And what kind but, of a company uh, yeah, it was a CPG, right? Like a billion dollar plus CPG company. And, so, uh, but then, uh, and and where are you trying to sell the product? If your product is, if what you what you have built is good for a billion dollar plus CPG company, or that kind of that range of company, that size of company, that scale of company, then you need to go sell to that level of companies. Who may be interested in the product? What I, where are you selling? Are you selling into the large CPGs? So uh, 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 yeah, we recently started approaching customers, and uh, we are trying to see like they should be at least uh, twenty million dollars in India because the twenty one million dollars. If you think the product is good for billion dollar CPGs, what will twenty million dollars companies do with it? So there are a couple of reasons. One, the reason number one is like you know the company where I implemented this was in US, right? When I was there, and you know so, and if we compare this uh, similar size of company in India, maybe two hundred million dollars, right? Who would be doing the similar kind of you know stuff like similar kind of products, and you know but they will be smaller, right? Here from the revenue perspective, and even from the per product cost perspective, right? Whatever they are selling. That's number one, and the second reason is uh, we want to go slow. With, we don't want to directly approach the Fortune or uh, bigger companies. We want the initial customer wants some SME so that we can you know get the data and validate, uh, make it some little more robust the product, and you know then we want to approach the bigger customers. So these are the two reasons. Uh, you know I'm going to a smaller it's customer and. It's the question. 
question that I'm really asking is that the pain point that you're solving, is that pain point as acute for smaller companies or is that pain point largely only present in the very large CPGs or very large pharma companies? That's the question that you need to answer. Yeah, so the pain point is mainly for the larger companies. Uh, it, it's not based on actually revenue, it's the number of SKUs and the complexities they have. You know, and uh, to to make it simple, it is for larger companies, yeah, because small companies will have. That's what my worry is. If you try to go sell to smaller companies, you will be you may not be able to sell because they don't have this problem to that extent. Maybe they, maybe they don't have as many SKUs. Maybe unless there's a there's a large number of SKUs, you may not be able to sell the product, and, and that means that the company the target. The customers that you're going after are not the right customers. They're not your target audience. Right. Uh, I, 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 I see in yeah. the in that's a mismatch I see in what you're telling me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, I I agree with you. And uh, means you know we can definitely start going to um, after talking to you we can start approaching directly the very big customers. Right. I don't. And I don't think you have a choice if your product solves the problem that only large customers have, then you go better try to sell to the large customers. Trying to sell a product to small customers who don't have that problem, you will get absolutely nowhere. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's my primary feedback based on what you've shared with me so far. Uh -huh. And um, you know, on, uh, from the perspective of uh, questions, I have a question like, you know, if there, if there are, uh, you know, part-time founders, right? Like, will that be a good idea to keep the part? And how how means you know how should we talk about the you know? Um, that's one of the questions I have. Like, how should we talk about whether in the you know the equity percentage and all you know? Well, that's something that you have to decide who's contributing what in terms of equity percentages and and stuff like that and and. and come to an agreement among those founders. Part-time founders are okay because, remember we were talking about earlier on in the show with Girish, he started his company while he was still working a full-time job and he was doing this part-time. So part-time founder is not a problem, I don't think. In my opinion, it's not a problem. Um, as long as you figure out the mechanics and the you know details of how that founding team interacts, how you work, you know, how you make sure that you're not encroaching upon your employer's time and so forth, if that's what you're doing, if you're bootstrapping with a paycheck. Yeah. Yeah, yeah like I am full-time, but there are other folks who are interested part-time, so just, okay, I got your point. So, and that's a very common way to get businesses off the ground, one person to be full-time, several others to be part-time, or several uh, founders to be part-time. All of those are acceptable ways of, um, you know, bringing a company off the ground. Mm -hmm. And another thing I wanted to know was like, you know, if, like, you know, if you talk about most of the companies, it, this is mainly for the manufacturing to start with, right? So most of the companies, uh, you know, even in India, right, they have their headquarters in US. They may not, they may be having some, you know, uh, product selling here or some branches here or in China, right, as, a, as far as manufacturing is concerned. But they're headquartered in the US. So, you know, if I try reaching based on your, you know, feedback, if I try reaching bigger customers, I will end up talking to, you know, their headquarters here in the US. So at this stage when my product is, you know, like uh, with a demo version and all, how far you recommend like, you know, approaching this big customers, you know, and uh, you know, or I should not be doing that at this stage. Enterprise sale is very complicated, especially if you're working with MNCs. It's very complicated. You need to understand where the decision making happens inside of the company for that particular product. You have to navigate the organization, understand the decision making process, and so on and so forth. So it's, uh, there's no one answer to that. You're going to have to understand particular company by company what is their situation. Where is the decision? Yeah, so that, that yeah, that that's uh, for sure, right? But my question was like, you know, at this stage, right? Because that the complexity will still be same whether I be I have you know I've reached a certain stage in my you know growth, 
or revenue or whatever, right? The complexity with the enterprise the customer will remain the same. But yes. my question was like at this stage, whether I should be going to the enterprise bigger customer or I should start with, you know, some smaller customer, I should not be because I, unless I don't I want to. If you try to sell this product to smaller customers who don't have the problem, they're not going to buy the product. You mm -hmm. have to find customers who have the problem that you're trying to solve. You're asking me, okay, it is what I suggest. This, the recording of this call is going to be available. Listen to it a few more times so that you can internalize what I said. Good. Going to smaller customers is not an option because smaller customers do not have the pain that you're trying to solve. Okay? Right. Yeah. Almost do not have any option but to navigate the organization complexity because the only people who have the pain that you're trying to solve are the larger customers. Mm -hmm. yeah? Right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, folks, I'm going to spend a few minutes um, explaining to you uh, how to work with 1M1M if that's something that you want to do. And before I do that, mm -hmm. I want to request you. If you like what we're doing here, please refer 1M1M to serious entrepreneurs out there in your friends, family, fellow entrepreneurs who are looking for help and looking for mentoring and support and, and guidance. And uh, that's because we, as I said when we were talking to Girish, the only reason we are here is to make you successful. We can do nothing with what our mission is without good, serious entrepreneurs who are willing to do the work required to build a successful company. So this is not a, you know, short-term, three-month, six-month process. To build a real company takes many years. And the story that you heard from Girish, he started the company in 1999. Today, sitting in 2015, he's, you know, he's built a very substantial company and, and so forth. But all this is, is a very lengthy journey, and that's the kind of entrepreneurs we are looking for who are willing and able to make that lengthy journey. So resource-wise, you'll find everything at 1mby1m.com. You will find a very powerful blog, which has a tremendous amount of learning material for you, both educational and inspirational material. Then we have the Entrepreneur Journeys book series, of which we've published 12 books. Today with Girish, we discovered, uh, discussed bootstrapping with a paycheck and billion dollar unicorns. Both of those books were relevant to his journey. Uh, Girish is actually, his case study is in the billion dollar unicorns book, and he's also used the bootstrapping with a paycheck technique to get his company rolling. And you heard what his perspective is on the subject. Um, so in general, our philosophy with the Entrepreneur Journey series is to give you a you know, low priced entry point into the the methodology and the philosophy and the mechanics of the 1M1M program and our strategy, our methodology. So feel free to check these books out. And um, they're all available on Amazon Kindle. Um, the blog is at stromanometro.com. This is what the site looks like. We also have lots of videos on the website. These roundtables happen every week. So next week is our 250th roundtable. We've had thousands and thousands of people come to these sessions and use this forum to get input. And uh, we will continue to do this for as long as we can. And um, you need to go to the free public roundtables page to book your slot, whether it's to pitch or attend, just go register there. The entire roster and registration links are all available over there. Um, also, we have the 1M1M premium program for extensive methodology guidance on every step of your journey. We have a great curriculum. We help you with business development. We help you with extensive strategy consulting. We have private roundtables where we do a lot of strategy consulting work. And then we also help you with financing if your business gets to a point where it's, where it's fundable, we'll introduce you to investors. And in that process, we will help you you know, figure out the steps to put together a proper funding pitch, strategies of how to frame a business such that it is fundable. And in some cases, businesses are not fundable, and you have to kind of diagnose that. We'll help you do that as well, in which case you're better off pursuing a different strategy than going after investors. We also help you with getting coverage in the media as well as 
lots of visibility in social media through our channels. The Million Dollar Club, there's a link on the website where you meet some of the case studies, successes of the one-on-one -on -one program, and the ROI equation that we offer is $375,000 plus 5 to 10% equity worth of value for just $1,000 annual membership fee and no equity. We do not charge any equity in helping you. Um, we give you lots of orientation material on how to use the program. The one in one self assessment is a very good starting point for the program. So you ask the questions that we would ask you. We want you to have good, solid, defensible answers to those questions. Where you have knowledge gaps, we have provided curriculum modules on that page itself, but you would only be able to access them if you are a premium member. Um, there's tons of material on the website to, ch to learn how to, what to expect from the premium program. We have a whole body of video FAQs that you will be able to use to evaluate whether this program is for me, you or not. In the curriculum, we have core and elective, and we have hundreds of case studies of successful entrepreneurs who have come to this forum and shared their journeys, their case studies, and their advice. We have synthesized all this into a very powerful curriculum that is delivered today in video lectures and the rocket case studies themselves. So it's a, you know, it's a very powerful body of work. Um, this is what we have in the curriculum. In the core modules, we have bootstrapping, positioning, market sizing, customer validation, financing, customer acquisition, and team building. In the electives, we have all sorts of industry sector specific stuff like Web 3.0 and e-commerce, cloud computing and business solutions, including big data, uh, mobile and social apps, healthcare, IT, online education. We have a new module called Building Billion Dollar Unicorns. So there's a, you know, there's a very extensive body of curriculum that you would be able to tap into as you navigate your way through the entrepreneurial journey that you will be experiencing. Our methodology is lean, capital-efficient, bootstrap startups. And the philosophy is bootstrap first, raise money later. And that is basically what's happening in the industry right now. Investors have also come to that conclusion that they want entrepreneurs to bootstrap up to a point, and they want to invest once there is some validation. So you're going to have to learn to bootstrap, and we teach you how to bootstrap extensively because we believe that that is very, very important in your entrepreneurial journey. If you go to our press page on the website, you will find a link called Coverage of One and One and Premium Members. And that gives you visibility into um, all sorts of, you know, articles and stuff that we have done for our premium members. And you can look at this video, how to use the One and One and Twitter channel. This actually gives you access to our Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, all of the social media channels and our social media presence is very significant. Just to give you a, a data point, I have almost 80,000 followers on LinkedIn, and whatever we do with you on this Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, all of it flows through that entire channel. You can get a lot of visibility by leveraging our social media channel and our blog. Um, we have an affiliate program, so if you're trying to build a community, work on community development, community entrepreneurship development, happy to partner with you, and you're very welcome to use the one and one affiliate partnership model. We have three more roundtables from now until mid-March, and then I'm traveling for a couple of weeks, so we have a bit of a break at the end of, the, uh, end of March. Um, Vision India 2020 is the 13th book from the one and one program, and that is um, an ideation book. It's written as business fiction, as if we're sitting in 2020 looking back on building these companies and has $45 billion ideas. You can look at them and see if you want to work on any of those, and you can morph, steal, whatever you want to do with them. I publish them because I will not be working on them. Um, I'm working on 1M1M, one &M and I don't have time to work on other ideas. 1M1M uh, Incubator in a Box is our platform that which we use to work with our corporate partners to deliver um, various incubation programs, corporate incubation programs, or regional incubation programs with other partners. And just another rundown through the recent books, Billion Dollar Unicorns is our most recent book in the Entrepreneur Journey series, Carnival in the Cloud, 
It focuses on cloud computing, bootstrapping with a paycheck, focuses on the technique of bootstrapping with a paycheck. From e-commerce to Web 3.0, focuses on that domain and the evolution of the Internet. Each of them are the same structure of case studies and analysis synthesis. So every single volume is chock full of case studies of successful entrepreneurs who have built sizable companies and what you can learn from them, how you can learn from them. That's it. So we have five minutes of Q&A time left, and any one of you could call in if you like. Um, I see some questions from Shubro, which you, are, uh, you have sent to Maureen, so I will answer your questions. Let me just read them. Shubro Ghosh is asked, saying, I can understand the product a little too big. In fact, we have a complete part of pharmacy also, which we have plugged off now, and so is insurance. Starting from doctors to members to labs to pharmacy and insurance all have their back end, which they can manage and, and user can view, check, and compare all before buying or taking any decision. So Shubro, I think the problem is that you have too many things going on here, and you haven't started collecting any checks, you know, any payments from anybody. So you need to figure out which one you want to go sell and start selling and building a business. Just building products without selling is not going to help you build a business. It's a mistake a lot of entrepreneurs make. They think that they can just go and sit in the lab and build products without selling. That's not how to build a business. Anybody else? Questions, comments? And Hello, feel uh, just a moment, moment. Let me introduce you to Irina Patterson. If you have questions about the 1M 1M program, you're welcome to also contact Irina. Her email is irina at 1mby1m.com. She'll be happy to answer your questions. And if you want to talk to her, her phone number is 786-301-2456. I, I think she would prefer that you email her and set up a time to talk. But she would be very happy to get on the phone with you and talk to you about anything you want. Ramana, uh, this is Pranay. Yeah. So uh, the quick question, like, you know, um, which uh, do you recommend accelerator and which accelerator for enterprise B2B business would be a good one? One million by one. Uh, all right. <laughs> good, good. So you are accelerator too, right? Okay. We are an accelerator. We're not an accelerator too. We are an accelerator. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's the first and only okay. global virtual incubator and accelerator in the world. Mm -hmm. yeah, you said you don't charge equity, that's why I got confused. <laughs> we don't charge equity, we just $1,000 annual membership fee. Okay. If you try to go to accelerators who charge you equity, most of them will reject you until you become fundable. We don't have any criteria, we accept everybody. We are happy to teach you how to build a business. Whether you're fundable or not, we don't care. Mm -hmm. You can bootstrap sure. your business. We have lots of companies who bootstrap their businesses to very sizable you know, levels. And you just heard today from Girish, who has bootstrapped his business $300 million and you know, many billions of dollars of valuation. So we are perfectly OK supporting that mode of business building as well. This is why we don't charge equity. If we okay. invest in your company, then we will charge equity. But if we don't invest in your company, we're not going to charge you equity. Okay. Okay, okay let me take a few more questions from the audience. Um, Parthesh Chibar is asking, who are in the panel to mentor the participants, India, US, online or offline? All our mentoring is done by me. We have had over 600 successful entrepreneurs, including 350 entrepreneurs who have built highly valuable companies, highly valued companies, and over 40 unicorn entrepreneurs participate in our case study programs. So our mentoring is based on this case study-based um, video lectures and case study-based curriculum. That is the asynchronous mode of mentoring. And then we have, we have uh, round tables where we do the actual synchronous mentoring. So please try to understand the program. We have India, US, everything all over the world. This is a completely global program. The case studies are global. The people, the entrepreneurs who have come and been part of this program 
to share their knowledge and their experience are all global. Um, Prasad is asking, I'm the founder of Snap Tricks B2B, cloud B2B integration, and unlike many companies, I'm the only one person, excluding development team, doing the architecture marketing strategy development. I'm feeling this as a weak link as we cannot grow as we want to. My questions are how to overcome this. How does an investor see this? So, so is this a business? Are you, are you already in business? Are you generating money? Is there, are there clients? Okay. So then you should start, um, start bringing in, um, bringing in more people as you develop the company. So there, you know, this is a very tried and true approach, right? You get clients, you start fulfilling your obligations to the client, you bring in new team members and, and build the business organically. How does that investor see this? I, we don't know because you, you haven't shown us what is your business model, what is, what, you know, what are you working on, how, exactly what part of cloud B2B integration. Cloud B2B integration is a very, you know, very broad topic. So where in there, there's a lot of huge competition in that market. You know, there's MuleSoft, there is SnapLogic, there's all kinds of companies that are in cloud B2B integration. So you have to tell us where you're going, what is the competitive positioning, how are you going to build this business, and then that would determine where, whether investors would be interested or not. Maureen, uh, I have already answered Pranay's question. Pranay is asking which accelerator do you recommend for enterprise B2B sales business, one million by one million? I already answered his question. <laughs> Prasad, if you're in the same space as MuleSoft, then you're going to need to create a competitive positioning against MuleSoft such that there is a case for investment. MuleSoft is a gigantic company. It's clearly the market leader in that space. So why, if you expect investors to be, invested in, uh, to be interested in, in a company that is a competitor to MuleSoft at this stage of the game, while MuleSoft is almost a billion-dollar valuation company, what is the case for that investment? How are you going to compete with MuleSoft? Anybody else? Anybody else? So, uh, Shamana, uh, in this program, the $1,000 uh, annual membership fee, do you help in getting customers? Yes, if you, uh, if like we have, if you, uh, if you have, have a network in the uh, going after, yes, we do. Like enterprise customers, right? Yeah. Like big big end. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yep. <clears throat> Anybody else? Sorry, I had to switch hands. Sorry, the handset was running out of battery. <laughs> hi, Shamana. This is Irina. I hi. just want to say hi. Go ahead. If you want to add something to uh, what I've said, we are all well, ready to wrap up. Yes, if nobody asking any questions, maybe Shamana, can you explain when is the right time to join the program? Well, it sounds like, Irina, you're asking a question that a lot of people are asking you uh, offline, so uh, Irina is prompting me to answer this question so that people get that answer here in the forum. Well, you know, we prefer that you join the program as early in your cycle as possible, because we, otherwise you're going to waste a lot of your resources and most importantly your own emotional energy and physical energy and intellectual energy. And we would rather have you focus all that energy and your resources on a definitive methodology that is proven rather than fussing around and, and wasting time, wasting runway. So. We have no problems with early stage businesses. You can join as early as possible or as you want to. We can also work with you at any stage of the game. So 1M, 1M is not a class. You know, it's not like this is a three month Y Combinator class that starts in March or April. It's an ongoing program. You join whenever you want to and your clock will start ticking from when you join for a year and then 
there is no end to the program either. If you decide that you need more help and you want to continue being in the program for three, four, five years, that's no problem. We have lots of entrepreneurs in the program who've been in the program for several years because we acknowledge that it takes time to build a business, to go from zero to one million, to go from you know, one million to two million to three million to five million. All this is a very lengthy, cumbersome, complex process and if you decide that you're getting value out of one million by one million and you want to stay in the program for a lengthy period of time, that is perfectly all right. We have no notion of graduating from the program or any of that. As long as you're finding value, no one's gonna kick you out. And you can join as early as possible. Let's say you're bootstrapping with a paycheck and you're just toying with an idea, it's okay to join the program and start, start using the program, start following the program to develop your idea, okay? All right, last call for questions. If nobody has any further questions, I'm gonna close the session. Anybody? No? Okay, just one more little question. What is the, I'm not sure about my idea, and if, if I don't have no idea what I'm going to build, but I wanna build something. Okay, that's fine. So if you if you have maybe, no idea or if you have 10 ideas, either way, you're gonna to have to learn validation methodology. So eventually you're gonna to have to come up with some idea and just simmering in this environment. You can start by just attending these public round tables. They're free, right? You can attend as many as you want. You can attend 40 round tables, free of charge, you know, public round tables, and simmer in this environment of entrepreneurship and innovation and it will stimulate things in your brain. It will give you ideas and then you can see what you want to do. Now if you decide to join the program, you'll have full validation methodology to follow through and if you have 10 ideas, you can, you can run those tests, basically the validation methodology against those 10 ideas and see which one you want to follow through on and really build up. Okay folks, I think we're going to close out the session for today. Let's meet back here for our big milestone event, that's 250th Roundtable uh, next week, and uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Bye, everybody. Thank you.